Good afternoon, Michael Malice here, back from New York. Uh, I have with us a guest who might be one of the most requested guests I have. We swim in the same circles. Uh, we have not had an interaction before. I'm really excited to have Richard Hanania on the show. He's the author, most recently, of The Origins of Woke. Uh, he's also the president of the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology. Richard, I don't no longer know like who hates who. So I'm going to apologize for what I'm about to say if I'm stepping on a rake. But mm. I put you in the same mental set as people like James Lindsay, Rob Henderson, Oren McIntyre to some extent. By which I mean, okay, see, I, I already fucked up. But I'm what, not making not my friend Rob Henderson is my friend. So Rob, that face is not for you. Uh, but okay, I, but but my me. what I meant by that is people who understand that politics is much more about anthropology than it is about what well, the problem is with the Republicans. And looking at how people behave and make decisions, as opposed to thinking it's literally about the issues, which is just surface chatter, uh, obscuring how power actually behaves. Is that inaccurate, the the, the definition as opposed to the grouping? Um, I, it, it, somewhat. I mean, I am interested in the culture wars, these sort of uh, but, sure. you know, metapolitics. Um, the origins of woke is sort of almost like the opposite end of the spectrum of that. It gets very deep into the weeds of what was the uh, Department of Labor doing in the Nixon administration that led to our current state yes. of racial classifications at HR. So it, it, it is sort of like very wonky at the same time too. Um, you know, I don't have just one interest. I, I like a constellation of questions that I like looking at them from uh, different directions. Um, so yeah, I, I'm broad. So it's, it's not like, you know, it's, 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 it's easy to sort of say, oh, this guy just talks about this one thing, but often I'm talking about something else too. Sure. Sure. Of course. Because I think, the, I think that the interesting thing is how often, uh, these currents inter, inter, uh, interact with each other. So like 20 years ago, it would just be, you know, Washington, D.C., the Republicans. Now it's like, wait a minute, let, let's look at what the New York Times is doing. Let's look at what Yale's doing. Let's look at what Hollywood's doing. That's causing, you know, Nancy Pelosi to go up on TV and start talking about trans rights. This didn't come sui generis, but the old, like, kind of conservative analysis would be like, all oh, the Democrats are at it again. It's just like, well, why are the Democrats at it? And why are they at this specific thing at this specific moment? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. If you watch Sean Hannity or something, it's out, uh, it's uh, marketed to a mass audience. It's Hillary Clinton did this, and then Barack Obama did this. And you even you get this even like among the online right, among some people who are seen as a little bit more sophisticated observers, you do get these kind of conspiratorial, or I would call them the soft conspiratorial thing, where the liberals are dividing people or they're classifying people together or they're trying to get people to go in you know one direction or other i really i have a um uh, i have a sort of libertarian worldview but it's also an a sort of uh, epistemology that's consistent with that and that i think we live in a world of unintended consequences and very few people can even foresee the direct consequences of the things that they're advocating for, much less something like trans rights or uh, or wokeness or whatever, being some kind of plan or strategy from some class of people. Like I tend not to have that uh, worldview. So yeah, it's almost the, it's, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum. If someone thinks the Democratic Party is is pulling the strings on, on the culture, uh, yeah, I, I don't think anyone's pulling the th strings. I think the cultural market sort of works like the political market. There's a lot of the, or the, or the economic market. Um, there's just a lot of things going on and a lot of psychological uh, uh, psychological tendencies and a lot of, you know, uh, narrow sort of public choice kind of interests. Um, voters matter, elites matter. And uh, yeah, we're just trying to sort it all out. What, what, what? So which of those names that I mentioned at the beginning, and they've all been past guests in the show, mind you, um, did, you did you make a face at and... and <laughs> Uh, and and why? If I'm okay, ask. so uh, you know, I, I, who cares? Like, I'll just I'll just tell you. So, Oren McIntyre, I muted okay. him a very long time ago. His analysis annoys me a lot. Um, okay, he has uh, he had this thing. I don't know. Somebody just sent me the picture. It's like that the Baltimore bridge collapse before we even knew what would happen. Right? It was like we live in a society where merit and competence don't matter. And I was like, I'm not I'm not against drawing that conclusion. If there was like a doctor who got ahead with affirmative action, so sure. But it was like immediate. Right. And he does this thing where he has this meme and it's worth talking about. I don't have any problem with him personally. I never interacted with him. I never talked to him. So I, I, he could be a fine guy. I don't have anything personal. Uh, he has this, he, he, I think he posted this meme where it's like, they just want to diddle your kids or something. For people who don't know, we'll put up on the screen. There's a Simpsons meme yeah. where the bus driver is saying, don't make me tap the sign. Yeah. And what someone had 
photoshopped the sign to be it was one of Oron's tweets. And the tweet says, it's not complicated. They're just evil and want to diddle kids. So that's <laughs> what you're think, you're right, exactly. And I don't believe that any large portion of liberalism can be explained by them wanting to diddle the kids. It's going the opposite direction. Leonardo DiCaprio's 40. He has a wife that's 20 or a girlfriend that's 20. And they go, look at these pedophiles. I mean, they, these people are... <laughs> These people are insane. They don't even want adults having sex. <laughs> okay, so you you are one of the big voices out there who is broadly speaking very clearly right of center. Uh, you're not an egalitarian, I think it's fair to say. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you're very skeptical of this kind of uh, um, progressive vision of using the state to kind of impose this sort of forced equality and so on and so forth. But at the same time, you go very hard against like trad cons. Uh, and that whole emerging kind of space uh, on the new right. Can you uh, take your time? Actually, we have plenty of time. Can you give us uh, what you regard? Because the thing is, they know the tradcon argument. They know the progressive arguments against being a tradcon. They've rejected them. I would like to hear yours. Uh, so I think you classified me as anti-egalitarian, pro-liberty pro merit, all that good stuff. Now there's yeah. the trade comp thing, but there's also the, the nationalist kind of sure. wing of conservatism that I don't like. And I think it's, you know, very interesting if you're against, uh, you know, DEI because you believe some people are more competent than others and you believe in freedom and all this other stuff. Um, it's hard to justify immigration restrictions. It's hard to justify restrictions on trade. People should have jobs. Why? Because they were born in this country. If someone wants to do it cheaper and is better at the job, I mean, why wouldn't you be open to that? So it's kind of, it's kind of a, there's a kind of, um, uh, a tension there between the you know the pro merit the pro freedom thing and then the nationalist thing. I see nationalism as a more inclusive DEI that also shuts out most of most of the world. Um, and I think that the the tradcon stuff. I'm a little bit you know I'm sort of sympathetic to some aspects of social conservatism as a um, as a cultural project. Um, yes, like the like I live a traditional li a life. I have a family. I I'm not. I'm not polyamorous or anything like that. I think it's good. I think people get, uh, get married, have children. Um, that's a good thing. I think that's the path to happiness and the path yep. to society, society moving forward because we raise the next generation and all that good stuff. Um, I think that you cannot oppose, uh, impose that through government. Um, yep. I, and I think that it's often backfired when governments have tried like Iran um, the, uh, the people are, the people are basically some of the most secular in the Muslim world and they apparently hate the government. We see that they erupt in protests every, uh, every few years you have, even you can compare European nations. So like Catholic nations that have, uh, strong laws against LGBT and abortion, they often have lower birth rates than the Northern European countries, uh, where they just, you know, they're, they're complete libertarians on these issues. Um, and so I'm, I don't see the sort of, I see, I see the cost and freedom of social conservatism. Um, I see, you know, I think if people want to have surrogacy, if they want to have uh, babies in any way possible, I think that's, uh, that's a great thing. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I think there might be harms to pornography or prostitution, but you know, whatever, it's a free country, people can do um, things, things that harm them. Uh, if there was some kind of payoff that I could see that was directly from social uh, conservatism as a political project. I could be sympathetic to it. I just don't see the evidence for it. Okay. Well, l th there's a lot there to to discuss, and um, so one of the things like is, I just saw a tweet from yours today when you were talking about you know the case for for legalizing prostitution, where you're like, it's a freedom issue. The end. Like there's nothing else to say. The argument I always make, which I, I think is compelling, is the women who engage in this work are the most likely to be the victims of male violence, and they have to have recourse to security or you know someone after the fact or otherwise they get killed at extremely high rates they get beaten at very high rates uh and if you want to minister to them and kind of take them a path to kind of what you would regard as a more civilized life it has to be legalized in that sense because when you marginalize these people you're causing them to become further victims than they otherwise would be yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a perfectly fine argument. Same things with drug legalization. I mean these people, you know, these a lot of these people who die of overdoses, uh, they apparently don't know what they're taking. That right. you know would probably not happen if if drugs were legalized. Um, so yeah, there's. Um, I mean, I, I you know you can always argue sort of. I think this is the standard libertarian thing to do. 
is to argue in terms of the effects and people make arguments like that and they're, and they're fine arguments. At the same time, I, you know, I was influenced by a recent article by uh, Scott Alexander. Did you see this on Valentine's Day? It was- No, about, I, have, was I love him though. He's amazing. It, it, it's, 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 it's one of my favorite articles that he's written. Um, I forget what it's titled, but it was on Valentine's Day. You can go back and look at it. Uh, he's basically saying like, look, when it comes to romance, it's the one thing where everyone is a libertarian on. We don't have to justify Oh, this woman wants to marry this man. Okay, like, is you know, do we need like a tax? Do we need a license for people to date other people? Um, do we need to ban certain forms of relationships between consenting adults? We just say, look, there might be costs, there might be benefits, but you go out there in life and you know you take your own risks and you're an adult and you have dignity and this is just part of what it means to be human. And he says those of us who are libertarians, I don't know if he calls himself even a libertarian, but it's like heavily implied in the art in the article. It's basically we uh, take that position that most people take to romantic love and we apply it to everything, right? We apply it to market. If I want to start a business, I want to sell you anything in the world. If I want to sell you my organs or whatever, it's most of the time it's going to be good. The, 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 you know, the Hayekian and Milton Friedman and all these guys are great. And they give you the arguments as to why that will uh, maximize the well-being of society. And that's great. And we should point out those arguments. Um, but in the end, it is just, I believe in human freedom and I, you know, it can be overcome. It's not a, it's not an absolute, but the evidence has to be very, very strong. And it's very rarely that strong. Well, let's talk about an issue where I think this is where, um, the human freedom argument to me, isn't nuanced enough. Uh, and that's the issue of euthanasia, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a system where euthanasia is legal and I, I can wrap my head around it being broadly speaking legal, uh, I'm very concerned that there is a system in place, especially when you're dealing with organizations that are worried about costs and governments, which in my opinion, don't really value human life, where someone who is not in a very good uh, mental headspace, to put it mildly, uh, might, it might not take much for them to get nudged in the direction you know, where they end up being encouraged to take their own life, whereas it would be more costly and there's really no profit to kind of pull them back off the ledge. It's an interesting argument because we often hear that doctors um, have an incentive to treat too much. Um, right. And so we often hear that in the medical system. And I also, worry, you know, so you could also potentially worry about a system where they're just making a lot of money by pumping you full of these machines that are going to keep you alive forever. Sure. Um, and so that's a problem too. So people are always worried about, oh, the, you know, the Canadian government is going to start offing you to save some money, <laughs> like, like maybe. But I mean, the other thing is also a concern. It's people, so people don't seem to take that into account. And I, I you know, I think that if anything, you know, you have to ask as Western societies, which, which side like you think our medical systems are likely to err on? Are we going to err on the side of, you know, eliminating the weak? I don't see like us as the kind of society that does that. I think we err on the side of um, welfare statism and um, spending a lot of money on causes that are necessarily uh, not, you know, not necessarily uh, fruitful. And we, you know, it's hard to, from what, from what I hear, I mean, people, people can bring up like cases in Canada where it seems like, okay, maybe, uh, maybe this was a, a case of euthanasia gone too far. But I actually wrote an article where I went and I tried to find the percentage of cases. How many people are euthanasia? How many people, uh, how many of them are not like people with uh, cancer, terminal diseases? It's like, it's like, you know, they're like the average age is like 70 or something like that. They okay. almost all have uh, serious diseases. And so it's like, maybe there's a few cases you can find. But look, if you want to find the number of, I mean, the number of cases, if you actually wanted to start totaling up, how many people are being kept alive in just miserable conditions, costing a lot of money? You know, it's it's hard from what I hear to actually get a do not resuscitate order enforced. I think we're a society, we're societies that actually value human life maybe a little bit too much. I mean, I think we're too safetyist. I think we should be taking risks. Like I think child children car seats and you know stuff like that. I think we go too far with that stuff. So you you can worry about either one. But I think given the current state of our society, I worry about them keeping too many people alive under terrible conditions and starting to, to you know, off people left and right. Folks, let's face it. Life can be stressful. It can be overwhelming. And it's not just your mind that suffers when you're feeling tense and anxious. Stress can make a mess of your digestion and immune system too. But here's the thing. You can handle it. Introducing Just Calm. It's the breakthrough new stress-busting formula from Just Thrive. Say goodbye to frazzled nerves. Say hello to a steady, chill, more relaxed you. Just Calm's exclusive mood lifting blend is clinically proven to help you relax and breathe a little easier in as little as four weeks. And for next level mood and immune support, give the award-winning Just Thrive Probiotic a try 
as I'm doing and am reaping the benefits. It not only has 1,000 times better survivability than most probiotics, but this spore probiotic banishes bloat and constipation so your gut can produce more serotonin, which is your happy hormone. Plus, it supports better sleep. You can wake up feeling refreshed and revitalized. With Just Calm and Just Thrive Probiotic, you'll have the ultimate stress-fighting duo to help you win the day every day, and all with a money-back guarantee. What do you have to lose? For a limited time, you can try Just Thrive risk-free. You can save 20% off a 90-day bottle of Just Thrive Probiotic and Just Calm when you go to justthrivehealth.com and use promo code WELCOME. That's like getting a month for free with a money-back guarantee and a portion of every purchase goes to Vitamin Angels, which is a nonprofit organization that saves the lives of millions of children and moms-to-be around the world by ensuring they get the vitamins and minerals they need to stay healthy and strong. To learn more about Just Thrive Health and all their clinically-backed products, don't miss my special episode where I interviewed Tina Anderson, who is the CEO and co-founder. Take control today with Just Thrive. Folks, traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat, which can lead to acne, to allergies, to stuffy noses, and it is gross. Miracle Made offers a full line of self cleaning, eco friendly bedding, such as sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that prevent 99% of bacteria and require three times less laundry. They're infused with silver, and that prevents up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, which leads them staying cleaner and fresher three times longer. No more gross odors. And by using these silver-infused fabrics, which were inspired by NASA, the Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long, so you get better sleep every night. They're very comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Miracle Made sheets are designed for your skin. Bacteria can clog your pores. It causes breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Here's all you got to do. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo malice at checkout, you get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product. It's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you aren't 100% satisfied, full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice. Use code malice to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash malice to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. Let's get back to the show. But what about what do you think of this very common pro life argument, which is once you start, you know, at the margins valuing human life less and less, it's a very quick slippery slope until you get to this kind of Nazi style eugenics. So I mean, we're, I mean, like, so there's always a trade off in public policy, we sure. don't, we don't uh, value human life infinitely, right. Um, and so yeah, it's hard. So it's like we don't have this absolutist thing. I mean, the, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, a, I mean, you could look at the other direction again, like the slippery slope. So would we get to a point where government is going to take, take away your freedom um, and is going to let not let you make the most intimate decisions about your life? Where is that slope? Which slippery slope are we on? I see us, Michael, I see us much more on the slippery slope that you don't have freedom. Everything has to be safety. We're going to take care of you no matter whether you want it or not. I see us farther down that slippery slope than, you know, a eugenics program that is eliminating the weak, the weak you know, the people in our society who need the most help. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, like you look at these stories out of New York City, it's like, you know, it's like there's been 60 people. I, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but the basic idea is like 60 people have been arrested on the subway this year. Between them, they have like 500 arrests. <laughs> it's like, yeah. why are these people, why, like these 50 people or whatever, like who have all these hundreds of arrests, like why are they terrorizing the subway and make it terrible? We are too much on the side of like every, we have to save every hopeless case. Um, if, you know, if one day we get to the point where we're just shooting criminals in the street, maybe we worry about we have valued human life too little. Um, but I think that we're sort of at the point where we are too uh, safetyist and too soft, and that's the slippery slope. I think we're we've already gone down. Well, I think there's there's there there could be two slopes. You know, you know what I mean? I, I think it depends. So, for example, that to your point about how you know this it's it's completely disproportional. Uh, especially in big cities, the amount of crimes that are committed. And this was the whole broken windows, Manhattan Institute Giuliani idea. That's like 
crime isn't just distributed randomly in the population. It's going to be a few people who are disproportionately committing a huge chunk of crime. So if you get the guy who's jumping the turnstile, he's probably got warrants. And he, if he's jumping the turnstile, he's, he's far more likely than you or I to be a rapist or a murderer or a burglar as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And and if you just have that approach, and it was just kind of targeting as opposed to treating everyone so generous and this kind of egalitarian you know, uh, uh, figure made out of clay, you're going to find the people who are causing the problems. So I agree with you in the point that uh, um, they're, they're not enforcing laws and, and in a very, I think, intentional way. But on the other hand, if you see people like Kyle Rittenhouse and Daniel Perry in New York, they are the ones who are being targeted by the state. It's those who are protecting human life who are regarded as uh, uh, public enemy number one. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, there is this weird thing where if you're a career criminal uh you can get away with a lot more than you seem like you can while they yeah. over you know they overcharge people who are def you know defending uh people so i think that's like a good way of saying there could be multiple things um going on at once so that's why i'm not a big fan of uh, i wrote this piece called social conservatism with 40 chess i'm not a big fan of making these big connections oh if we have euthanasia it's going to lead to xyz i think we could debate euthanasia or we can debate abortion or we should probably debate these things on their own merits because there's always so much things so many things going on with other issues so as far as like the euthanasia question i'd ask within our medical system without this within this sort of hyper bureaucratized uh sort of left wing with the equity culture are we likely to err on the side of eliminating the weak or are we likely to err on the side of um, hopeless uh long-term care that doesn't take personal autonomy seriously uh enough um and so if we're going to make a slippery slope argument i would think it, in that case it goes in the other direction but no, I, just specifically to this point with the euthanasia, like I, I'm thinking with regards to like so-called trans kids, right? That basically now we're at a point in many examples, and I'm sure you, you, you might believe that, that that these stories are overblown and I could, I could wrap my head around that. But basically they go to the doctor and they'll be given puberty blockers or, or very quickly. It's just like, okay, you got this. Okay, here you go. Get a script. It is not these kind of barriers in place like there were back in the day where before you had to have this surgery, you had to like year, live a year as a woman. It's like, look, before we take the knife out, you got to wear the dress for some time and, and mm -hmm. present in a certain way. Like, let's make sure before we do irreversible uh, uh, can, uh, changes that this is something you're really certain about. And now if I feel like it's almost, or maybe I could be incorrect, that this is just like, oh, here you go. Like, it's almost like a, like a, a vague uh, getting a warrant. It's just like an afterthought. So the concern yeah. is there's the people on the tubes, right? Who are, you know, like, okay, what are we gonna do about them? Where that's a euthanasia situation where it's like, okay, this is basically like a cyborg at that point. But I'm also specifically concerned about people who are simply depressive. And my worry is that they're just, depression is very consistent. It's, it's very pernicious. It's very sinister that if they are just going to back to that doctor over X amount of time and nothing's working at a certain point, the doctor's like, okay, fine. Like it's no skin off my back. That's my concern. Mm. And so this might sound a little extreme, but are we sure there are no cases where depression isn't actually hopeless and someone is going to live a miserable life, you know, no oh, matter what? Oh, that happens. That's a thing yeah, for sure. And, and so do we say we don't want euthanasia ever in that case? Look, I was pretty depressed when I was a, a teenager. I didn't, I was sure awkward. I had no friends. If you told me I have to go back to what I was like, 14 year old, 14 years old. And that was like my, my permanent personality, whatever. I, I didn't have the tools to, to change or better myself. Sure. You say you live that life or you kill yourself. I, you know, I think I would, I would take it. And it's, it's anybody, any observer would say, look, this guy didn't have a terminal condition or anything. Um, but from knowing my own life and how much it sucked, I would say, yeah. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not, a am not, a, um, you know, I don't, I don't know about this assumption we make that like we necessarily always know better from the outside. Look, I'm sure there'll be, I'm sure there'll be, if you had like a completely libertarian euthanasia regime where you could just buy a suicide pill at the right. grocery store, um, I'm sure there would be, I'm sure there would be mistakes. Um, you know, that's probably, that could be going too far. Um, but a lot of these cases where like you keep persistently going to a doctor and, you know, you say, I want to end it and the doctor agrees. How do we say from the outside that those, you know, the, the, that, that, that that's a bad outcome? Okay, I see. I see your point. That that that's that that's valid. Let's talk a bit about the uh, uh, pro life situation because this is the issue where I think that people have the highest sympathy and the lowest empathy 
one of my little smarmy lines is I'm really confused because I want to kill babies, but I also want to control women's bodies. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what to decide to choose. There, there seems to be this, I, I, just the talking past each other is almost um, a point of pride where the pro-life side, which I think is very heavily sympathetic and I can very much understand their emotions, are just insistent that their opponents want to kill kids. And like period, end of story, uh, there's a beating heart, it's a kid, what else do you need to say? If it's not nine months, when are you gonna put it earlier? End of discussion. Whereas the pro-choice side is just gonna be like, look, like how dare you insinuate yourself into this very intimate situation uh if you this is not something that's done loosely uh and if you have a problem with it don't do it yourself but like i'm not how like how dare you kind of uh intervene between decision between my uh, uh the woman and her doctor uh, I, i'm curious because i know you've you've written a bit about this in the past uh your thoughts on this whole kerfuffle and how it's how it's argued in in our culture more specifically yeah i mean the so the the what the pro life side does is they say they start with definitions and then they work from there. So they say, what's a human life? Okay, it's a human life. It has a heartbeat or it has uh, DNA. Uh, it has its own DNA. Uh, okay, uh, therefore we have a rule that we don't end human life. Um, and I just the I, I think that's just sort of the the wrong way. Uh, to do it right it's like you know an argument a libertarian can make is like it's wrong to take money out of people's pockets that's stealing taxation is stealing therefore we shouldn't have taxation and it's like yes you can have a you can have that's not convincing to me i mean even though I, I want low taxes um it's you know it's it's obviously taxation is in some ways different from stealing and we have to consider taxation as one thing and stealing which is just destructive and has no uh redeeming qualities at all as something else um and so you can play that definition game um i think that i think that clearly we don't take this view that life is to be protect, protected at all times I, again like we have you know we have uh uh we, we drive cars we, we go through life and we, we take the risk of death and sometimes we have wars and sometimes we kill in self-defense and sometimes we have death penalty often the people who are pro-life are often conservatives who believe in the in the death penalty too um, and so we have to look at it as just a, I think we see life as one value um, among many. What, all, what other values do we take into account? Quality of life, um, individual liberty, family autonomy, um, and like just, you know, the, the sort of the situation that a person's going uh, to be born into and sort of their relationships and connections with other people, right? And so that's how you consider. You consider the life thing as one thing in a much larger constellation, um, the potential for a happy life for the baby um, in one, 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 one thing. And nobody wants to admit that. It's, it's hard for like the, the left on this issue to say, they just have to say it's not a life. They just have to say right. it doesn't, you know, it doesn't exist. It's like a rock or, or yeah, whatever. Right. Um, yeah. And that, you know, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that, you know, that's, that's, I don't think that make much, much sense either, but it's hard to, Acknowledge it's a life, and then start talking in terms of trade-offs. But I think that's what you need to do to have a reasonable position on this. Yeah, I, I think it, it, when they're just like oh, it's just a clump of cells. To any woman who's ever been pregnant or who's had a family member who's pregnant, who's seen ultrasounds, no matter how big, uh, you know, the growing infant is. Yeah, at that point, you're just like, I'm sorry, this is not something that you can be glib about, or you know, just treat it kind of like you know, sneezing. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, and a lot of these, yeah, I mean, and, and it's like, and so I remember actually, I'm, I'm on a, I've been meaning to write something on the abortion issue uh, at some point, but I think, you know, I'm one of those people, like, I take the position that if you like beat up a pregnant woman and the baby dies, like, I think you should be arrested for, uh, you know, for murder. Um, and some people would say, well, that's a little weird. You're pre you're pro, uh, you're pro choice. Um, and I would say, no, actually, because the baby, like wh what we think of that baby is actually um, the social context matters quite a bit. The fact that its own parents, I mean, it seems mean, <laughs> parents don't even know what to, but it's like, when, when, you know, when, you know, when you have a planned pregnancy and you're looking forward to a child, you give the child a name, right? It's a, to me, that's a person at that point because we socially, social, we sort of socially constructed that personhood. So the, the couple or the woman ending the pregnancy is different from some, you know, uh, some uh, home invader coming in and like, you know, ending the baby's life. And so I think society can treat those two things. If you just say it's a life or it's not a life, um, it doesn't capture that distinction. That's why I'm not a fan of thinking in those terms. Hey, folks, Michael Malice here, tolerated author, 
Twitter asshole, and sheath underwear model. I love wearing sheath. I wear it every single day. They're the most comfortable briefs you'll ever wear. And I'm currently designing a new pair of sheath based on a certain type of fish, which you'll see in the coming months. Every time you hear my voice, you should know I'm wearing sheath. And what makes sheath different is that they have dual pouch technology. They have one pouch for one part of your male anatomy, another pouch for another part of your male anatomy. Sounds weird, but when you put them on, they're going to be super comfortable. They keep you cool in the hot weather, keep you nice and snug in an interview, on a date, doing a podcast, so on and so forth. After you tried sheath, you're never going back to the other brands. Support the underwear that supports you. Go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off. That's sheathunderwear.com, promo code M-A-L-I-C-E, 20% off. They've got shirts, they've got hoodies, they've got mesh ones. They have something for you. They also have a girl's line, but since women aren't allowed to listen to the show, I can't help you. Sheathunderwear.com, promo code MALICE. Folks, did you know Fast Growing Trees is the biggest online nursery in the U.S.? They've got over 10,000 different kinds of plants and over 2 million happy customers in the U.S. They have everything you could possibly want, fruit trees, palm trees, evergreens, house plants, and whatever you're interested in, they have it for you so you could find the perfect fit for your climate and space. And Fast Growing Trees makes it easy to order online. Your plants are shipped directly to your door in one to two days. And along with their 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee, free plant consultation forever. They gave me a gift certificate. And they said, order whatever you want. And I found a cool tree and it came safe and sound very quickly and it was thriving. So I can personally tell you, this is a website that I have used and enjoyed purchasing from. And as many of you know, I do have a bit of a green thumb thanks to my disabilities. This spring, they have the best deals online, up to half off on select plants and other deals. And listeners to our show get an additional 15% off their first purchase when using code WELCOME at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com using code WELCOME at checkout. Fastgrowingtrees.com code WELCOME offers valid for limited time. Terms and conditions may apply. Let's get back to the show. Uh, one of the things that I've found personally is that, uh, and, and I'm curious to hear you if you disagree with any element of what I'm about to say, is that as our culture has become increasingly siloized, by which I mean People who are, you know, conservatives consume conservative media. There's content designed just for them that kind of uh, uh, appeals to their biases. And I'm not saying this is a negative thing. Leftists will have their own kind of, you know, menu, a place to choose from. And these groups kind of talk to each other less and less. What I'm finding is discourse is getting stupider and stupider. Yeah. And I don't think this is me becoming a curmudgeon or like just aging out. I'm like, this is just dumb shit. And if you had to argue with even just like a regular person from the other side, you'd feel stupid. Yeah. I don't know if it's it, that silo that sort of uh, we're in the our silos. That could be something. Sometimes people get in silos and they develop sort of like elaborate theories like these communists or libertarians splitting sure. into factions. So sometimes silo, uh, siloing people can be sort of uh, uh, good for intellectual ferment. I think yes. the big thing that's going on. And I, I have a sort of natural experiment here because I have a Substack and I have a Twitter and I'm the same person. I mean, I, I write differently. I'm a little bit more trolly and so forth on, on Twitter. Um, but I can look at my average comment on Twitter and I can look at my average comment on Substack and I can see that, the, you know, it's a 30 point, I don't know, 30, 20 point IQ difference. I mean, yeah. it's, it's massive. The people who will read my essays are just on a different level. So you think about like 15 years ago, all we had was blogs, newspapers, academic journals, books. Like if you wanted to be part of the intellectual sphere, all you had, you had to actually read long yeah. form. Barrier to entry. Form. Exactly. There was a barrier to entry. And now you have Twitter and then like, you know, I'm too old to really have grown up with TikTok, but then it's like, it's not even words anymore. It's just music and like 10 seconds of, of video. And, you know, it's just, I think everyone now has an opinion and a way to communicate with it. And yeah, we've gotten dumber. I, I do think that technology sort of explains this. Yeah. I, I, and it's also, it's as the attention span shortens, which I don't think is inherently necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it become, it very much um, is encouraging sloganeering. So instead of having like, kind of like, let's break this down, you know, the big argument, it's just like, nope, we're just going to just say this one thing and la, 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 repeat it over and over. 
uh, yeah. and, and that's that. And just trans you know, women are women. Trans women are women. Right. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Why do you think that this is a way to communicate? Yeah. Yeah. It's so but it, it, right. So it, it, there's this great Margaret. You know, I never thought of it in this context. Context. That's really interesting. You said that. So this is great Margaret Thatcher quote. Wow, I have to use this more often. Where she says, "There she is, right behind me, uh, on the cover of the white pill." Where she says, um, uh, "Having being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you aren't." So, <laughs> <laughs> like, That's very nice. talk about a perfect response to this: trans women are women. Yeah. Trans women are women. Yeah, like there's your answer. Yeah. Yeah, it was a different meaning back then, right? Saying you were a lady meant you weren't loose, and now it just it, it could be reappropriated. I love that. Sure, That's sure. Cool. But I, 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 listen, <laughs> yeah. the slogan stands. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's cool. It's cool that it changes with the time. That's what yeah. I'm saying. It's pretty cool. So I, I am curious to hear your thoughts. So here's something else I want to talk to you about, and this is something that affects you personally. So there were a number of hit pieces against you. Uh, Richard Hanani, a racist race, whatever, or racist origins, uh, by which clearly it means outgroup. But there's a really funny headline I saw, which I, I don't remember where it was, which should live organization, or RAG. It was like, why is this racist still getting work? And yeah. to me, one of my little lines is impotent signaling is much funnier than virtue signaling. So basically, they're like, we told you this guy is anathema, he's outgroup. Like we've all had this consensus, the powers that be, like we've told you, like he's put him yeah. in the cornfield. How are you still, how is this still happening? We decided he's, he's persona non grata. What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. I think it was either that, uh, it might be the headline you're thinking of, or it might be a different one. It was like, why, why did Silicon Valley giving all the, this racist so much money? And yeah, it's okay. like, yeah, that was a, okay. Sure, I, maybe I, and I love these because they always seem, make me seem very important. I mean, they have these, these hit pieces. I have the most like, uh, flattering hit pieces that exist. They're like, oh, he's for, you know, he's, this person likes him, this person, uh, you know, that person listens to him. And the people who like me are, in general, in these articles, much more impressive than the people who, who dislike me. They're people who've accomplished things and done done great things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I wrote an article on uh, on this too, uh, like it was a retrospective on all this called How to Not Get Canceled. Yeah. And I think like a lot of this was just solved by uh, the market, like the internet, even though YouTube and all these other platforms are often censor censorious, um, they, they there was a market and now you can go off and you can do your own thing. So it's not like, I mean, the way like right wingers used to talk about national review, like 15 years ago, like it's so, it's so weird. They were like so obsessed with national review. You were like, you were banned from national review. That's it. You could not have a career in conservatism if they, if they decided you were wrong. And it's just funny now, national review is just one magazine out of, you know, the dozens or hundreds on the right. And like, nobody it's even cares still, about it's magazines. Still the best paleo, it's still the best paleontology magazine out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't remember the last time I, I read uh, a national review article. I mean, it's still there. It's probably more influential than Washington average, but like the idea that this would be like the arbiter of like what you could say online. Right. And today you have just these, you know, these, these lunatics who have millions, hundreds of thousands or millions of followers on X. Of course, Elon buying X um, was a, you know, was a big deal. You had Substack. Um, and so the, the censorship problem in many ways was was solved it was solved almost too well like i think that a lot of uh, people have been talking in the last uh, a couple of weeks about on twitter just the, sort of the anti-semitism is an overdrive it's just all non-stop is you're a jew you're a jew that's i'm not even jewish i'm, I'm an arab but i get i get this all the time i just like, well, they no, think no, anyone's then, smarter. But then you're i am jewish but then you're jew controlled yeah so well it, it, like, yeah no, but I'm I'm Jewish. I mean, I'm Jewish to them because I think it just means anyone's big nose and smarter than me. Is, no, it is means our, Jewish. It, it means it means our group. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. It's, it's it's so it's like it's 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 everywhere, and you see these tweets. I mean, they go they go viral, and there's just there's this uh, account. His name was Matt. Uh, I don't know if you know what, what I'm talking about. It's like 1.6 million followers, okay. and I never heard of this guy until like you know a few weeks ago. And I was like, this guy's, and you look at his account, it's literally just made up. It's not stuff that's, um, you know, it's not taken out of context news. That's different, taken out of context news or exaggerated or relying on poor sourcing. It's just freaking made up. And that's a problem. That's not great that that's like, you know, getting more probably, uh, probably engagement on Twitter than like CNN or whatever for all of CNN's, uh, for all of CNN's faults. Um, and so, yeah, the market, you know, did sort of solved the censorship problem and then brought new problems along with it. Yeah, the the point I always make is um, uh, you don't need a majority, you just need an alternative. 
right? So if there had just been Elon's Twitter during COVID, for example, the outcome would have been you know, quite different than what ended up happening. But to your point, like conservatives, um, and I'm certainly not insulting you by calling you a conservative, have this, they can't take a win, right? Like they, they like when they take, because it's not like the New York Times is going to say, all right, this is our big L, you know, conservatives got us this time. They're just going to pretend it never happened. Like a good example I always use is, was it 2015 around? Refugees welcome, refugees welcome, refugees welcome. We need to have mass migration from the Middle East. Uh, I would remember I was in upstate New York at, at some like gourmet cupcake shop, refugees welcome. Like imagine, like I'm, I, like one day I'm in Syria, the next day I'm in upstate New York and like, oh, good thing there's this sign in language I can't read. Now I can buy cupcakes, which hope which are probably gonna be haram anyway. Um, and then they get plastered over with the Black Lives Matter sign and, and so on and so forth. Linda Sarsour, on TV every five minutes. Now bitches on a milk carton. Like like yeah. they completely vanished her uh, and you don't hear this issue anymore. And this was because it just kind of went away because the polls and the voting didn't go the way that they wanted. To this point, uh, I'm not saying this cancel stuff has gone away, but the fact is if this was 2016, they were would have been in a position to kind of destroy you. And now they're explicitly saying, wait a minute, I don't understand. This yeah. guy still has a platform and is yeah. respected and a book deal at a major publisher uh, yeah. and, and has an audience. And like, what the fuck, guys? I thought we agreed on this. Once we say he's a racist, yeah. you can't talk to him. The end. Yeah, just it's just you know when I look back, it's just amazing how contingent life is, right? If these writings were like 2009, 2010, if this came out any other time, before that, I would have probably been screwed. It could have came out 2015, 2016. I was lucky because I had sort of, I, I built a sort of name, you know, a, a, under my own name, I had, you know, built a sort of body of work. And then it was after Elon Musk had bought Twitter and after yeah. Substack, it literally had to happen. <laughs> like, right? you know, if it happened like three, anytime between 2009 and 2019 uh, or 2020, I would have been screwed. Um, and so, yeah, man, it's like, it's like, it's like surviving a war where like, you know, you know, everyone around you was dead and you should have been dead. The bomb dropped directly on your head, but you just walk away and go and live the rest of your life. So is this the kind of thing where, when, when the hit pieces started, right? Were you like, oh shit, like, obviously you didn't take it lightly, but how, like, can you walk us through just psychologically what effect that had on you? So yeah, I, I, yeah, I wrote a little bit about this in that article I, I mentioned. But yeah, I was um, I was on vacation. I don't take many vacations, so I was with my family in uh, San Diego. And I get this. Um, I was up at the restaurant, and I get this call from a New York uh, uh, area code, and it's the guy. It's the reporter from the uh, Huffington Post. And I'm I, I, I was taking a piss. I was taking a piss, and I was listening to the voice message. I Wait, didn't literally? answer. I don't answer. I don't answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. I was I was. I was because I don't answer, you know, nobody answers calls. It's all telemarketers or bad news, right? So I just right. listen to the voice message. It's like, oh, hi, I have, I think I have enough evidence to say blah, 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 blah. I just wanted to talk to you. You know, he reaches me through DMs. Um, he reaches me uh, through emails. I just ignore Wait, him. Wait, hold on, but, hold on. I got to say one thing, though. You got to give him, I, I'm going to give him credit where it's due. The fact that he tried to reach out to you for comment is more than what a lot of them would have done. So mm -hmm. you, I, I have to give him some modicum respect for at least doing that. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I never said he was like a. Um, yeah, I mean, he was. He wasn't a bad journalist. I, I think yeah. he did actually a pretty decent job <laughs> as far as yeah. journalism. Now his intentions was obviously so over the top. Like sure. I think it sort of backfired because he's like he's like tagging everybody. Will this person denounce him? Will this thing? And it was like it was just too much. He just he should have actually just let the let the piece speak for itself. Um, right. But then I get calls from. Uh, and texts from other people like within the next three days you know he's he's he, he's you know because jd vance in one interview said we knew each other so like you know he's like he like reached out to jd vance he reached out to like people who blurred my book um and actually i, I listened to him on a podcast later and, the, and he was saying and some the, the person who was interviewing him i think it was on the, like the daily beast uh, some kind of daily beast podcast the guy was saying i never saw a story with so many uh uh no comments it was like I thought I'd go to the article. It's like this person, no comment. This person, no comment. This person, no comment. Because people, first of all, people are just sick of this shit, right? right this is right. this is twenty twenty three. People are just sick of it. People know me. Like people know me. Like who's a, as a person who's honest and who's not afraid of controversy, right? And they hear, you know, I, I said some you know bad things twelve, thirteen years ago. Um, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna rush to denounce me or anything like that. Um, and so. It also you know, just one thing. It doesn't mean they're rushing to embrace you. Like if I know you, I'm not yeah. responsible for anything you say. It's like, yeah, oh, Richard yeah. has some smart thoughts. I want to talk to him on my show. Yeah. End of yeah. story. We're we're not getting married. Yeah. There's no nuptials. I mean, we're not co-signing on a loan. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, did this guy being like a good journalist, he's like, we reached out to the Washington Post and because I've had an op-ed in the Washington, a couple in the Washington Post and an op-ed in the New York Times, like they were supposed to say, oh my God, we're so sorry. And like the Washington Post, New York Times, like whatever, like they didn't say anything about it, right? So this guy was just expecting like everyone in the world to rise up with one voice. Like it was, uh, I don't know, like after 9-11 or something, we're you know, going after Al-Qaeda. And right. people were just, you know, people are, people are just, uh, uh, people are just beyond it. Um, and you know, probably, I mean, like leftists still have this culture. So there's, there's leftists who will engage with me on Twitter sometimes. And then right wingers, we've, we've criticized right wingers here about the misinformation, all that stuff. They don't have this as part of the culture where it's like, even if a right winger hates me and their followers, maybe they're still like, wait a minute, why are you engaging with this person? You shouldn't be talking to them. I think it's partly, they still think it's like 2012 and like yeah. they're in the position to like legitimize you or not. Yeah. And so like, I'll be like a bigger Twitter account than somebody and they'll be like, don't legitimize it. It's like, I'm more important and bigger than you. So like 10 by 10 times, so like, you know, what are, what are you afraid of? Um, and, and so, the, you know, I, I think leftists are probably, you know, it, it still works on the left that like, there's enough of the audience that's going to snipe at you if you talk to a, uh, a, a canceled person. But man, on the center, on the right, it just it, it just doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it, it's it's and the other thing is that canceled person has to be canceled. I think like some people are canceled for like really like egregious things. You know, it's just like really a complete over the top so on and so forth. Um, one of my greatest achievements in 2023 was getting Roseanne Barr back on Twitter, speaking of which, <laughs> because I mean, talk about someone who's the victim of, of just absolute over the top ridiculousness yeah. um, and someone who was so universally beloved for so long. Um, and, you know, now she's maybe she's, you know, persona non grata in Hollywood because it's been established, you know, that, that she's a racist. But other than that, I mean, the woman is just still a force of nature. She's still the, no one has to worry about like oh i'm talking to roseanne it's not she's not radioactive but where this shit went down uh she most certainly was in certain circles four or five minutes so i, I think i think again speaking to what we said earlier this is if not a win it's certainly an enormous amelioration of the power and the damage and i would hope people just take a step back and acknowledge that because that is a very different landscape than the one that you know we all have to kind of uh, weather the storm about yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Now, I will say I'll, I'll make a distinction in that, like, it doesn't look that way if you're, say, on a university campus often. Oh, sure. Um, yep. Because yep. I mean, the, yep. the just the radicals uh, entrench themselves. I, you know, I came out of academia, and I think what happens is it's not even like the rules or whatever. It's like anyone who is not a left wing crazy person is just selecting out. You just you, you won't get along with anybody if you're you know if you if you don't buy into it. Um, people aren't gonna you know support your research. They're not gonna give you jobs. You're not gonna get grants. Uh, and just the sort of the environment of being around these people who you think have crazy views. So anyone who's sort of I think that like the universities have just people have selected out of them that are in any way fr a free thinking or independent minded. Um, and so like, that's the one place, like if uh, whatever a young person like tells me they want to go into academia, I'm like, I don't know anything about like, you know, uh, theoretical physics. If you want to go do theoretical sure. physics, maybe the university is the best place to do it. But if you're thinking about becoming like a political scientist or doing something in the social sciences, anything that touches on uh, politics or ideology at all, uh, you could, you could find better opportunities elsewhere. I always try to sort of dissuade people from that. And especially because how are you going to, so even if you want to be a professional shit lib, how are you going to stand out from the slew, the torrent of professional shit libs that are being generated every year? Like what's your competitive market advantage? Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, that's, that's, that's the most basic question is like, it's just too competitive. Yeah. yeah. It's just like a bad financial decision because you're right. usually not going to find a job. Right. But even if you do, I'm telling you, yeah, your life is going to, your life yeah, is going to. Yeah. But it's also bad. like, what you're, what are you going to compete on? Like, I really hate Trump. Like, like, what are you bringing to the table as a graduate yeah. from these schools that your colleagues who are like basically clones of the same ideology aren't, aren't bringing. So even if you're just a lefty, you know, it's like, do you really think this is going to uh, uh, serve you well? Like, how are you going to make yourself stand out from your colleagues who have the same uh, ideology? My role model, Camille Paglia, uh, said, I, 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 I think I'm getting the verbiage correct, that the university system nowadays is institutionalized neurosis. Uh, yeah. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts as a former academic, if you think that that, because what happens is you have a young girl, a young co-ed goes to school and she comes back two years later, Thanksgiving dinner as a swamp walrus who cannot have a conversation with her family. And I think at some point this is either by design or evolutionarily has become the design. Uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts if, if you agree with Palia's perception. Yeah, I think the way it has become, 
you know, I think that people, they go to school and their whole lives, it's just, it's very structured. And, yeah. You know, they give you a grade, they give you a paper, they pat you on the head, they say, good job. And I think the people who stay in school for a long period of time, I, there was a, like a BLM protest, I, I remember back in 2019, 2020, but they're all, they're all like this, where it's like one of their demands is more mental health counseling. And like, basically, you know, more, uh, you know, often they'll protest, they'll want an African American studies department, right? It's like, it's amazing. It's like a, a revolutionary protest movement in, in the demand of like more bureaucracy, right? It's a very, very sort of uh, strange thing. And I do think that like universities just have sort of come to come to be places uh, where sort of the most mentally unstable among us. And, you know, you have to be sort of intelligent. So like at least above average intelligence and just sort of mentally unstable. And I think that's what's created these environments. You know, I think it's, you know, it's sometimes like, like when people want to fix the universities, I I just say, you know, like I'm more interested in like overschooling than I am you know, why does it take so long to be a lawyer in this country, right? Four years in college through your grad school. I'm more in- interested in that, but like when some countries just have a four-year degree for being a lawyer, um, then like, you know, are we letting in blacks with lower test scores or whatever? It's like, we're wasting everyone's time. There's way too much schooling. And like the DEI stuff, fine, that's bad, but it's like the system itself at its core is just, it's just bad. It's not good for the life cycle. It's not good for forming families. It's not good for growing up and being an adult human and contributing to society. Um, part of the reason I, I'm sort of like, a, uh, I think we overemphasize DEI and wokeness stuff, even though I wrote a book on the topic that I, you know, I want everyone to read, is that like, I think often it makes people, it leads people to be too obsessed with that and not think of these sort of more fundamental issues. Folks, I know virtually all of you have problems dressing yourselves, and the ones who do know how to dress yourselves have an even bigger problem about dressing yourselves well. So I want to talk to you about Roan, R-H-O-N-E. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion with the commuter collection. It offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, quarter zips, and polos, and you never have to worry about what to wear when you have the Roan commuter collection. Why? Their comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility, so you're free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work to your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle because Roan has wrinkle release technology. So that means wrinkles disappear as you stretch and you wear the products. It's just that easy. And there's even more. With their gold fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. Top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable. You can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. It's a great product at a reasonable price. Their commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. Head to roan.com slash malice, R-H-O-N-E dot com slash malice. Use promo code malice. You get 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to R-H-O-N-E dot com slash malice. Use code malice. It's time to find your corner office comfort. And I know some of you guys need a wardrobe upgrade. And I do mean guys. You know who I'm talking about. It's you. Folks, I want to talk to you about Bone Charge. It's a holistic wellness brand. They've got a huge range of evidence-based products to optimize your life in every way. It is founded on science but inspired by nature, and all Bone Charge products adopt ancestral ways of living in our modern-day world. And their extensive range of premium wellness products help you sleep better, perform better, have more energy, recover faster, balance hormones, reduce inflammation. The list is endless. From blue light glasses to red light therapy to EMF management and circadian-friendly lighting, Bone Charge products help you naturally address the issues of our modern-day way of life effortlessly and with maximum impact. This includes their infrared sauna blanket. If you want to burn more calories to help with weight, if you want to detoxify, if you've eaten badly, had a few drinks, if you want to look to ease stress and unwind as you're being very stressed right now, the infrared sauna blanket is for you. Easy to set up, takes less than a minute, rapidly heats up, and you can enjoy a session for 30, 40 minutes while relaxing, reading, watching TV, meditating, or listening to your favorite podcast, or even this. You'll feel more relaxed after the sessions, you'll feel revitalized after them, and you'll feel less stressed. Bone Charge ships worldwide in rapid time. It's made from vegan leather, and there's free shipping on every sauna blanket. They've got easy returns and exchanges with a 30-day trial and a 12-month warranty. Go to bonecharge.com slash welcome, B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E, and use code welcome to save 15% off. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E dot com slash welcome. Use code welcome to save 15% off. Let's get back to the show. Do you, so uh, here's a little, um, uh, I don't know if it's a softball question, but like I, I, I can already hear you groaning at the question. Okay. <laughs> so, right. In the, the circles you and I travel in, 
there's lots of these pet theories that kind of, you know, take root like in social media and then they kind of take on life its own. And since people are logic talking to each other, like it's like it's kind of becomes self-validating. And some of these some of these uh, um, theories are very clever and you can see how there's attractive intellectually. Um, what do you think? And I'm going to explain what this term is for the audience. What do you think of this whole concept of bio Leninism? Uh, so I, which I'm sure, okay, I knew it. I knew there's going to be some reaction. Well, the, the guy just attacked me. I don't know if you know this, but he just, I did not uh, know this. Okay. Okay. So uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah Let me, so I'll explain to people what the concept of bio Leninism is. So the concept of bio Leninism is basically it's, it's kind of a, uh, I don't know if it's a white nationalist or white supremacist at its base, but the idea is Lenin, you know, you know, moved culture very far to the left. This was like a radical change, both nationally, obviously in what became the Soviet Union and internationally. But his point is the people who otherwise could not compete for these jobs, uh, who are there because of DEI and, and affirmative action, so on and so forth, it is imperative on them to maintain that system just in terms of maintaining their status, because if that system goes away, then they're just going to be homeless or janitors or so on and so forth. And because of this, they know enough to kind of, I hope I'm not bungling this whole uh, hypothesis, hire, they have to hire fellow miscreants. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of, so basically it's going to cause the collapse of all these systems because it's selecting for people on the absolute wrong characteristics instead of selecting for something that's like intelligence or merit. Uh, so, so is, if, is that your impression of, am I characterizing correctly? And, and I didn't know you two were, were having a thing recently. Yeah. So, okay. So I'll say, I think that's, I think that's uh, approximately right. I'll say what I think is, is true in that. Um, first, and then I'll say why I, why I sort of don't like the oper oper operationalization, to use a fancy word, of, of how he sort of thinks about this. Who, so, who, uh, whose idea was that? I want to give the person credit or, or blame? Uh, he, he's, a, he's an anonymous, uh, he's, he goes by Spandrel. And I think he okay. like disappeared for a real long time, and then just he had just had one or two points, like a retrospective or on something, okay. something like that. Um, and so, yes, some people are not very intelligent or they're not you know hardworking or they're ugly or they're failures in some way that obviously influences their politics it, it has to and so many political movements are going to be bitter losers being bitter losers okay that's that that part is is, is absolutely you, true you, you sound just like trump <laughs> <laughs> you know there is a <laughs> bitter losers. Look, many yeah. people are bitter losers, being bitter losers, and we call that Hillary. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the yeah, I love the Trump. Uh, I love the like intellectual Trumpism. It's always like uh, you know, a, you know, we need tariffs. It's like no, it's just calling people losers. That's the intellectual yeah. Trumpism. Yes. Okay. So I'm giving you intellectual Trumpism. Right. Okay. So bio Trumpism. <laughs> it's winners and losers. The end. And you want to well, be a winner. Hey, Trump, well, here's the thing. Here's the critique. Uh, it comes from Trump because he's watching January. There's a report that he who knows if it's true or not. He's watching January six. And he's like, man, those people look fat. They look like scum. <laughs> so Trump, but people are going to jail for him. And what Trump realizes, and this is why Trump is the, you know, is, the, is a real intellectual here, is that it's not it's not limited to one side of the political. Right. So I, I get the idea of the violinism. It's right wing people trying to explain the left, and it's like, okay, you might have. And you know what? This doesn't explain all the left because guess what? The, you go to the, the smartest, best looking people in society are usually leftists. So it doesn't explain all the left. It explains some of the left, some of the weirdos. But then like, you know, go to go to rural West Virginia. I'm sorry, go to rural, rural Nebraska. Um, and, you know, just, I'm, I don't want to, you know, nothing against these places, but there's a lot of losers on your own side. And if you're just going to take like an average of like, you know, the, the most uh, dysfunctional places in the country, you know, the black areas are Democrat and the, the white areas of the most dysfunctional white areas are Republican. Um, and so I, 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 whenever I hear this theory, it's always a right wing person trying to explain the left. And it's never like this is this sort of explains a lot of the, the right and it explains a lot of the left, too. So that's that's my problem with the bio Leninism framework. So what did he go after you about? And what, what was that whole? Um, he doesn't like that. I like denounced, you know, my former racist writings. Um, it was, uh, I try to remember what it was, but I, one thing I don't like about these, a lot of these disinterrogations. Well, that's people, really I don't funny. Care. It's like, how dare this guy not be racist anymore? What kind of yeah. cuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. But it's, uh, no, the other thing was I, one thing I, one thing I, <laughs> one thing I just, you know, there was like a day after actually when that happened, when all the racists were standing up and they were like, this is the greatest guy. We're going to stand in his corner. And then I read thing like, you know, I don't really believe those things anymore. They're like, you know, 
this guy. <laughs> like a very like sort of heartbreak when that happened. The, the, the point I make is it's just actually funny because I interviewed Chris Cantwell, who is the so-called crying Nazi in Charlottesville um, mm. for my book, The New Right, because he was a former anarchist. Um, and, and we had a perfectly polite conversation, which started with Chris, do you want to put me in a gas chamber? He's like, no, no, you're, you're, you're safe. But yeah. he even acknowledged like, look, there's going to be in any space, stupid people, and there's going to be smart people. So I mm -hmm. think when you have, even in the, the racist spaces, there are going to be some who are like sophisticated and, and have a kind of a more nuanced approach. And there's just going to be like white good, you know, everyone else bad or, or white and Asian good and everyone else bad. Um, yeah. it, it's just, uh, to me, it's very hard to maintain a racist perspective as long as you see a few counterexamples because then yeah. it very quickly becomes baby bathwater. And it's like, I don't like killing babies. Like yeah. it's really gonna take a lot for me to be like, let's just, I don't yeah. care if this baby drowns. Um, and the smarter ones are like, okay, these data points don't matter, but I really think they do matter. It's those few right. people in any population who matter. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing I say that it's, it, it sounds like a troll, but it's actually one of those trolls that's actually serious. Any man who um, can attract a lot of women um, it's hard to be racist at that point because you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna crave variety and you're gonna have like a bunch of different options. Right, right. And even a guy who finds one girlfriend, you know, he's like, it was, it's, she's Filipino. No, no, no. I, right. I, I, yeah. Very few guys will will uh, will uh, will will prioritize their racism um, over you know their their love lives. So yeah, I think preferences. that. Uh, I, yeah, I think Gavin McKinnis said, you know, I, I don't think people are racist because people are too selfish. Um, I think that's I think that's right. I think people, when they find someone who, you know, someone who has attributes they care about, whether it's money or character or a similar sense of humor or, you know, a love interest. Um, yeah, it, it sort of melts the racism. It sort of melts the racism away. So, yeah, I think that's I think that's right. And I think like some people even like the left has criticized me. Oh, I wrote this piece. And I said back when I was sort of a loser, I was more racist. And now I'm not. It, it, it's, it's true. I mean, it's true. Like the the, I, the sort of more I think I've always been like a right leaning person. I've never been like a socialist. But like when I was unhappy, I was a fascist. <laughs> and when I was happy, I was a libertarian. And maybe that maybe unhappy people in some ways, uh, you know, see the truth better, but maybe not. Maybe they're too pessimistic. Um, yeah, I think that I'm happier now and I think my ideas are more likely to be correct. I, I, I don't know how you're going to answer this, although I would if I had to put a gun to my head, I would put a lot of money that you're going to say what I think. Um, yeah which is what do you think of this um, very boomer argument that Hitler was a leftist? <laughs> okay, I, think it's pretty, I think it's pretty boomer. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think that's a good But idea. he was a socialist, Richard. A doy. You know, there is. National you, socialist, he's a leftist. <laughs> read a book. Yeah, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I, no, there is like, um, I'm not going to say like, uh, uh, he's unquestionably a rightist because I do think that there are like these distinctions. Like I, I do think that like trying to find one ultimate, you know, one sort of there's like, you know, the Nate Silver had this article recently. It's like you have classical liberalism, you have conservatism and sure. you have uh, yep. leftism. And I think yes. that Hitler is the conservatism. So if you imagine a triangle instead of a spectrum. Uh, Hitler, I don't think that, I don't think the classical liberals, I don't think we can take the, I don't think you can really blame us for that. There's not a lot in Hitler's worldview that's, that's consistent with our own. Um, but yeah, as far as like tradition and like, you know, um, the in-group favoritism um, and, you know, glorification of your own cultures and, and traditions and all that. Um, yeah, I think Hitler was clearly on the right. I do think it's, what, it's what's it's fascinating about, about this taxonomy is I was asked because they're like, oh, more governments left, less governments right. I go, so according to your ideology, Emma Goldman is a right winger. And they're like, who? And I'm like, yeah. okay, good, great, good talk, good talk, people. <laughs> um, what are, are you, uh, let's stick to like uh, um, our stupid internet jargon. Are you white pilled or black pilled about the future of America? So I was just on the Spectator podcast, and yeah, they asked me that: Are, are you white pilled or black pilled? I am. Um, I am white pilled in certain ways and black pilled in other ways. I think well, that give me this fucking double talk answer. Come on, you gotta <laughs> politician. Listen, I'm yeah, more you're not like, well, I'll take both and get really high. I think people are black pilled about the, the wrong things, or they dilute their argument okay. by being too broad. Um, I think economically we're fine. We're fine. Like it could be better. I think we could be do better. But like as far as like other systems or like looking at the past, like those stupid memes where it's like 1950s, you could have had a wife working at a fast food restaurant and 10 kids and everything could have been. It's like, these things are obviously absurd and economists make fun of this stuff, but it's absolutely, they're absolutely right to, to do so. Um, I do think that at the same time- Wait, Can I say one thing? Cause this is just to your point, agreeing with it. 
when yeah. people are like, oh, because if you say, if something's a problem in our discourse, it's got to be a catastrophe and, and a crisis, right? You can't say, oh, this kind of sucks. Like if there was like a flu going around and like a lot of people got sick, it's like, okay, that sucks. It doesn't mean we have to shut down society, right? So in the same way that like, oh my God, the national debt's this huge number. And yeah. I always ask them, I go, what number is too much? Because 30 trillion and 1 trillion and 500 trillion, like these numbers just are numbers at this point. Like we can't conceive them. What number is too much? And how are you reaching that determination? Like at what point is like, okay, we're fucked. And they go, oh, so you're saying you could just spend whatever you want. I go, no, 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 no. You're making claim. You're saying we're at this point where it's Greta Thunberg. America's going to end. Like China's going to buy us 10 cents on the dollar. At what yeah. point is that number too much? And it's always like, oh, you're just, you just, you just don't care about spending money. And I'm like, okay, like yeah. you, you don't have an answer. Yeah, those have been who've been uh, catastrophizing about sort of the American economic st stability or our right. system as a whole. They haven't, they they haven't done well um, as far as predicting the future. Um, so you know, white pill there. Uh, at the same time, I do think there's something going on with sort of young people and and mental health. Yeah, um, I think that it's definitely gone down. I think culturally, this is going to be a strange example, but I just like I used to watch celebrities. You know, are you a basketball fan, Michael? Are you ever watch NBA? You might have seen it if you're ever any sport or, or anything. Like the people used to be. Klaus more... Nomi's tuxedo is right behind me. <laughs> no, I, I have not watched the NBA. Oh, okay. Well, this is then, then forget 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 that example. But just like people used to be more sure of themselves. There's some of these random videos on Twitter. There's a there's a, a video where they go into a bar. Uh, some like feminist journalist in like 1974 goes into a bar in Australia. I don't know if you've seen this. I, I posted it no. at the time. And she's like, Do you, are you uncomfortable? Because it was like a controversial thing whether women should be at bars at the time. She's like, are you uncomfortable with me being here? And the men, the way they handle this woman, it's like they don't like start cussing at her or call her Black a eyes. or anything. What? Black eyes. Black eyes? No, <laughs> they don't do that. They don't go that. They 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 find the happy medium between not being like a bunch of you know a bunch of wimps and like cowering from this feminist and not like insulting her, but just like laughing and joking and just being sort of relaxed. And it's just like something has been lost. Like men and you know women are just yeah. a lot more neurotic, a lot yes. less sure of themselves, and uh, than they used to be. And so, yeah, I just read uh, Abigail yeah. Schreier's book, uh, Bad Therapy. Yeah, and I think that's on the show. I, yeah, it's a it's a great book, and I think it made me it convinced me that a lot of it is the sort of the navel gazing from big psychiatry, from uh, this sort of obsession of mental health. We just made ourselves into this kind of navel gazing, you know, fragile kind of culture, and it, it it's 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 not it's not good. I mean, these cultural things. I think that a lot of the politics, a lot of the yeah. right wing trads, yeah. they're looking for a solution. Yep. And politics to this thing that is more cultural. Oh, if you just have to use the bathroom of your, you know, birth, <laughs> birth sex, and we protect women's sports, and you know, I don't know, we ban abortion or something. Like all these problems that, all these things that suck that you see and actually you could observe, and you're actually right about that. That's going to get better, but like, no, it's actually a much harder, a mar much harder problem to solve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 I really, and speaking to like about the anti-Semitism, this whole like, it's just one, one. even to, to libertarians, not saying that you, but like a lot of them, like, well, it's just the government or just the Jews or just this. It's like, if yeah. you think societies can be reduced to one factor that is kind of like the, you can get a magic bullet and then you're you're in utopia or like enormously, and I say this as an anarchist, I, I think it's absolutely crazy. Uh, so Richard's sending me a signed copy of his book and I'm going to read it fervently and going to have him back on so we could actually discuss it because when it's someone like you, I like to actually do the homework work uh and and read the book and then we can discuss and hash it out because i'm sure it's it's going to be very dense with lots of stuff that we can pick apart so congrats by the way was this all was all these hit pieces that came out against you was that a concern in terms of getting a book deal uh so i was um, i had the book i mean I, the, this was one month before the book was going to be uh published um, oh, so they, wow, were trying okay. to get, they were trying to get the book canceled oh. very very explicitly they tr they reached out to harper collins oh, they wow. uh, tagged them on twitter um and they were really trying hard. And uh, I think something would help Eric Nelson, the guy who, um, I don't know what to call him, my editor or whatever, he works at Harper Collins. He, he, he got me to do the book in the first place. He was always like a fan of mine. And so they were, they were solid on this. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was the hope. I, uh, I think it might have it actually helped the sales because right when it happened, like people, it just I was in I was trending on Twitter. I was like, you know, one of the top ten things on Twitter. Uh, so it it probably helped the sales. It probably at the same time it um, it probably like made leftists a little bit 
you know, a little bit scared to sure. touch it. Um, but yeah, the book ended up getting published and it ended up doing okay. So uh, yeah, the, 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 this was the intent. I think actually this might've been a thing that was in the works for a very long time. I think it was explicitly timed uh, exactly just to like, just be enough time to like cancel the book right there. I think that was actually not a conspiratorial person, but I think that's clearly what was going on and it thankfully fell. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I was just on Flagrant Andrew Schultz's podcast, and that hit piece on Andrew Huberman ran, um, and to, and I was just filled with murderous rage. And but at the same time, I think it's kind of DOA. But it's just like I get how you'd be a target. You're you're talking about politics. You're, you're kind of threatening powers that be in certain contexts and undermining their claims to authority. But someone whose entire career is like how you can sleep better, you know, how yeah. to maximize your output at work, mm -hmm. like how to become a better a dad and better community member like oh we got to take this guy down that's when in my view you're dealing well, with. well i mean is, isn't character though he's a public figure isn't character relevant I, I don't know much about huberman but if he's just like here's how to be a good dad and a good person isn't sort of like personal life then then maybe fair game no i i mean good dad in terms of like being a good man means you're going to be a good dad I, I mean literally like you should you know respect your wife so on and so forth it's more like sleep diet nutrition uh okay. just human, human flourishing uh and, and therefore being the dad is going to be a consequence well, that's part of human flourishing i don't know if you're screwing all these women and leading them on i don't know like i, I just yeah it's it's uh it's, to me it's not it's not that exactly that black and white really that's interesting i really i i the, i i can't show you the text i sent to lex but it, was, it certainly wasn't a positive one vis-a-vis -vis these reporters I, I i just think there are so many genuinely people in this culture uh who yeah. are trying to make things fundamentally worse for a lot of people intentionally so that that's who i would think if you had a, a modicum of decency would be your target uh, as opposed to someone who maybe he's hoeing around a little bit but all yeah. his output which is free is to help people flourish but that's like that's like nobody should write like gossip stories as long as like there's starving children in yemen or something it's like yeah but people write things that are necessarily not the most uh yeah, important but there's in the world but people there's are there's interested gossip in, in a system like a huge hit piece yeah, it's I don't know. It's 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 a uh, I think it's a judgment call journalism. But I the way I look at it, I provided the market for it because I was interested enough to read it. So okay, you know, fair enough, enough, fair enough. <laughs> okay, fair, fair point, very valid point. Uh, and I'm not saying this angrily. I'm saying this factually. Richard, we're running out of time. <laughs> uh, what has been your favorite part of this interview? Um, I like, uh, you know, I like the exploration of the, and something that I don't talk about much in interviews. I like the exploration of the, like the, the euthanasia and abortion issues. It's not something that like people want to talk about wokeness. They want to talk about the, like the latest thing I've written. This isn't something I've written tons about, but I, I've written a little bit about. It's usually not something that interviewers have focused on. So I appreciate that. And of course, hearing the people like my Sopranos analysis, that, that, that gave me a, you know, that gave me a, a little pump. Yep. Yeah. You are welcome. Sometime in the early 80s, REO Speedwagon's airplane made an unannounced middle-of-the-night landing. This is my friend Kyle McLaughlin, the star of Twin Peaks. And he's telling me about how he discovered a real-life Twin Peaks in rural North Carolina, not far from where he filmed Blue Velvet. What was on the plane was copious amounts of drugs coming in from South America. Supposedly, Pablo Escobar went looking for other spots, quiet, out-of-the-way places to bring in his cocaine. My name is Joshua Davis, and I'm an investigative reporter. Kyle and I talk all the time about the strange things we come across, but nothing was quite as strange as what we found in Varnum Town, North Carolina. There's crooked cops, brother against brother. Everyone's got a story to tell, but does the truth even exist? Welcome to Varnum Town. Varnum Town is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Pluto TV has over 300 channels and thousands of TV shows and movies for whatever mood you're in. Just open the app and something good will already be playing because it's curated by people who love TV as much as you do. So if you're in the mood for comedy, there's 18 channels that'll make you laugh. Looking for drama? We got so much of it, you'll cry tears of joy. Reality shows, game shows, sports, Star Trek, and even more Star Trek. No matter what mood you're in, there's something on Pluto TV. Just download the app and start streaming. Pluto TV. Stream now. Pay never.